uh, that introduction. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, you, uh, you are co-host, so you can share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, inviting me from, you know, time to time. Uh, thanks, Dr. Pandey, uh, for, you know, for uh, giving me the time to share my thoughts from uh, time to time. So today I will touch upon um, one specific area of data science, which is uh, machine learning. And uh, I am a practitioner of that. So in my day-to-day -day life, I use it. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that. I use it as part of my um, of my job, as well as uh, I practice it as part of some of my research work. Uh, and for one of them, even Dr. Pandey is involved, uh, he will recognize it. Um, so to start with, um, I'll show where machine learning has reached uh, now and don't want to make it uh, you know uh, depressive but this is what it is okay so you can see some images here uh, which looks like perfectly normal human being believe it or not none of these images are of real persons just this morning they were generated by a gan network a generative adversary network called uh, StyleGAN. So um, now a simplistic uh, trained machine learning algorithm, a GAN network can generate images where the human eye or even a machine cannot really uh, distinguish whether these are real humans or not. And um, you know, there is a, you can go there yourself. There is a interesting site called This Person Doesn't Exist. If you go there, every time you go to the homepage, all it does is the train GAN network, it generates one of a person which doesn't really exist. So these four images are created from that uh, just this morning. I mean, morning UK time, basically. So, um, Just to put things into uh, perspective and go through, you know, where machine learning uh, is right now, where it is heading to. So as we all know, within the technology world, at least, um, you know, we all follow through the, the Gartner hype cycle and especially for AI because it's an emerging tech. And if you follow the Gartner hype cycle, year on year, the majority of the elements within the Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies is dominated by uh, AI. So, uh, you know, every other area of technology uh, is being now married with AI, whether it is uh, distributed computing or even quantum computing, you can see, I mean, the one which was published uh, August last year, one of the first elements added there is quantum uh, ML, quantum machine uh, uh, learning mechanisms. And some of the ones are much more uh, advanced right now, like the generative AI. Uh, so the images that I was showing, that is generated by the generative AI. And it's a bit conservative curve, I would say. Um, so some of the things are more advanced than what uh, is shown in the hype cycle. So uh, here we can see that um, in the technology world, AI is almost dominating um, the emerging techs, and also it is merging with the other emerging techs that we can see uh, in the business. Uh, even the innovations are driven by AI. So there is one element in the curve you will see uh, towards the start is uh, AI driven innovation. So what does that mean is we are relying more and more on AI. And again, AI is used here as a very generic term. I mean, it covers all the data science aspects, but um, the point here is even for innovation, we are looking towards AI, which may or may not be you know, uh, the right approach, but that's what it is. 
And um, Gartner has started to do a very specific curve just for the AI and the adjoining domain. So, uh, I mean, data science uh, primarily. And you can see for some of those, they have actually gone beyond the, the peak, uh, which is basically the hype. When it goes down the peak, it is getting towards uh, mass market realization. So ML, of course, is uh, has gone through the peak. And again, this is a conservative curve, um, which means that where it is shown in the curve, the reality is probably somewhere uh, further than that. So for example, NL NLP, I mean, um, to my experience is much uh, beyond that. Uh, same as um, the deep neural networks. So the deep neural networks are much ahead than that. So uh, just to put a few things into perspective as well. So where does the word come from machine learning? There, there are debates, okay? So you might have seen this earlier as well. So it is um, generally uh, attributed to uh, Arthur Samuel. Arthur Samuel used to be um, one of the uh, hardware and software programmer uh, within IBM. He was coding uh, one of the initial uh, games, the checker games, as you can see in the image. Um, and uh, he's been attributed to coining the term machine learning. The reality is, uh, I have gone through all his papers. He actually never used the term machine learning. He talked everything about that, but never used the term machine learning. But anyway, so the paper which has been uh, suggested that where he used the term, he actually talked about it in a slightly different way as I uh, quoted uh, from, from the same uh, paper there. So that was published in 1959. Almost a decade back, uh, there was an interesting twisted um, uh, term that was used by Alan Turing, uh, not uh, far from where I am sitting uh, now. So he was from Maidavell uh, in London. Uh, I am around 15 minutes away from that place. Um, so he used the term learning machine and, and uh, he explicitly used that term. So uh, again, I mean, whoever we can uh, attribute to it's, uh, it's a personal choice, but the popular idea is it's Arthur, Arthur uh, Samuel who used it. Although personally, I prefer the word, word um, I mean, I don't prefer the word artificial intelligence because as we all know, it's not really, I mean, it's not artificial intelligence and general intelligence. And we have started to use the general artificial intelligence as well. It's probably more augmented intelligence. So it augments the intelligence that we have. And any business application that you see right now is actually that it augments our intelligence, whether it is a chatbot, whether it is uh, you know um, an assisted uh, doctor uh, ecosystem, they are assisting human intelligence. <coughs> so um, to see where machine learning is uh, leading towards or data science is leading towards, uh, of course, we are talking about this thing in the business sense because it is bringing uh, on disruptions. Disruptions on every possible business that we can think of, not just the business where, uh, you know, which are kind of high tech. So I picked few of them uh, here. So for example, HR management, there is a company uh, called Harvard Talent Pitch. Um, they were a startup, now they're getting much, much bigger. They are disrupting the HR management landscape using trained machine learning algorithm. So they are challenging the status quo of uh, how HR business used to work. Uh, in many of the companies, um, there is a trend now to outsource uh, HR management uh, instead of keeping it inside because things keep on evolving. And then as we all know, the way things work is it always starts with a CV and then you know, processing the CV. So the HR um, individuals, uh, they are not skilled on, uh, they don't have to be on every possible things that's there in the HR, in the, in the CV. So they do a keyword search, isn't it? So they will look for the keywords which the hiring manager has suggested and that's how it works. As we all can understand, that's not a very efficient way of doing things. So the Harvard talent pitch, um, they don't um, use any CV. 
So the way it works is there is a there is a trained machine learning model. So the candidate needs to interact with that uh, machine learning model using natural language. And uh, then based on how the candidate is interacting, the machine learning model provides some scenarios where scenarios based on the business um, and then how the candidate is reacting based on that a confidence score is generated by the model. And that's how the, the hiring process actually works. And it's very, very kind of uh, efficient and uh, seamless and very cost effective. And it actually um, allows the uh, both parties, the candidates and the companies uh, to have the near perfect match. Uh, and the next one, which I'm sure you all are aware and you have seen in uh, in uh, the press, uh, which is about law and legal contract management, because legal contract management is uh, very, very cumbersome, especially in business. So the way it works is um, once everything is agreed, the scope of some work. So if uh, my company, if I need to give uh, some work to be done, or if I want to delegate some work to uh, a partner, for example, a, a business organization, uh, a process automation organization or a technology partner, uh, we will have to get into a contractual agreement. So our lawyers will draft a contract and they will share with the, with the lawyers of the other organization. They will review it and they will put some red lines. They will say, this is not agreeable. This needs to be changed. So that redlining process, um, when they do that, it comes back uh, to our organization. Our lawyers will review those red lines. Then they will throw back with another red line or some comments. So this back and forth keeps happening and you never know when that will stop. Sometimes that almost stalls the project because you have a business critical time window where you want the entire thing to be done. And you don't know how long this, you know, back and forth of redlining will, uh, will go on. And by the time the lawyers agree, um, the opportunity might have gone from the market. So what logics are doing, uh, they're a startup they have a trained machine learning model where they have trained the model using you know, huge amount of uh, contractual data and what actually happened uh, through that. And it is um, NLP trained. So it understands where the redlining will happen and it can reduce the work of um, the back and forth and can you know, uh, add efficiency to the business. I'll talk about a bit uh, more on that because you know there is one thing that I am involved in, not really uh, for legal contract, but patents and standards, a similar concept. Doctors, um, that is something that is happening now, uh, now because you know the doctors try aging. When we go to a doctor, it's a it's a reactive experience, isn't it? When we have some sort of symptoms that we see, we go to the doctor. The doctor will ask us, uh, okay, what's happening? Tell us, you know, what are you experiencing? Then based on what we are saying, then the triaging starts. It's almost like a decision tree, right? So if this is happening, then the doctor will say, okay, are you experiencing X or Y? Then we say, okay, we are experiencing X. Okay, if you are experiencing X, then are you experiencing A and B and so on? So that triaging happens. That probably is an easiest way to uh, do it through a machine learning model. It can also be done through an expert system where the you know, rules are written by programmers, but the more efficient way of doing that is to train a model. And then there is a company here in, um, in the UK, uh, which um, with, um, I'm also closely involved with. It's called Babylon. It's, um, it's a trained machine learning model and there is an app um, you can interact with. So the triaging happens not by a doctor. Uh, it is trained by data provided by the doctor, but the triaging happens by uh, a machine learning model. There are real doctors there as well. When, you know, when the model basically triggers that now a real doctor needs to take over, but that decision is taken by the machine learning model as well. Now they're um, even talking about launching in India. I don't know if it's done or not. And it's there in US as well right now. Um, Newsfeed uh, editorial. This is um, this is something which is there in uh, 
India, uh, I believe. So the CEO of NDTV, he started this initiative. So uh, a trained machine learning model basically extract out the uh, editorial news feed. So which news feed should go in the online magazine or online uh, news portal. So the trained model actually decides that. Cybersecurity is one of the most critical one because right now what's happening is a majority of the cybersecurity attacks are actually uh, been triggered um, by uh, machine learning models. So to, um, to, to uh, kind of counter uh, that you have to have uh, trained machine learning models because otherwise it will become machine versus uh, the man, uh, which may not be that efficient. So CrowdStrike is using a uh, machine learning model to provide uh, endpoint security. So instead of uh, you know looking through uh, patterns in the logs or doing some uh, monitoring in the network operation centers, um, the entire uh, process is driven by a trained model. Even some of the things that we generally thought that these needs um, intuitive and creative inputs like software testing, um, that is also now been uh, uh, taken over and disrupted by uh, companies like Mabel who are using trained model to go through the code and do testing. Uh, white box testing and uh, black box testing as well. So black box testing is easy um, to do through uh, trained models. I mean, previously, anyway, there were lots of tools who were doing uh, rules-based uh, testing uh, through uh, automated scripts, but now even uh, white box testing where someone needs to go through the code, that is also done by uh, trained models. And uh, related to that is even software development. So builder.ai, um, they have a big presence in India as well, uh, where, I mean, after the low code uh, revolution or even the no code revolution, now uh, trained models are creating code as well. Uh, all you need to do is in a, in a natural language, you need to uh, provide the user stories and then the model basically takes that as an input and generates the code, which can then be looked um, by the software developers if some sort of uh, improvement, enhancements, or uh, optimization that needs to be done. So there, these are just a few which um, I pick just to show that almost every area that we can think of is getting disrupted by uh, machine learning. And uh, it is adding efficiency. At the same time, um, it is uh, almost challenging um, the human workers. But at the same time, it is providing additional avenues where um, we humans can uh, look for where our creativity makes sense. And uh, just to show that it's not just on those businesses, some of the areas where we may think that uh, it's still time for machine learning to uh, get into or data science to get into, but it's happening right now. Um, you know that uh, the Harry Potter series is stopped now, so the writer is not writing anymore, but the world doesn't stop there. It's, uh, you know, the world is a supply chain, isn't it? If there is a demand, someone will provide that supply. So what has happened is, um, one of the startup took a challenge that uh, they trained uh, a model and put an NLP layer on top. And then they trained the model using all the Harry Potter uh, books, movies, uh, commentaries, Facebook posts, uh, Twitter posts, so that the model had an idea of uh, what Harry Potter characters were, what the people were you know, liking and then uh, asked it in a controlled way to write a chapter of Harry Potter. So that's one of the chapters. This was done in 2018, 2019, but still this shows that some of the areas where we generally think that it is, um, it is a creative area, right? It can only be done by human, but uh, in reality, um, those areas are getting disrupted as well. And if you read that chapter, um, 
then it doesn't look like that it's created by a machine. It looks like it's created by the exact same author because the style is exactly the same. It, it, it uh, feels like it is a follow through uh, from the last book of Harry Potter. And um, the same idea goes into um, composing uh, music as well. So Alex the Kid is uh, one of the, you know, that's not his real name, that's his, that's his kind of screen name. Uh, he's a popular uh, rapper. And um, so he uh, wrote um, a piece called Not Easy. And then the composition was actually done or facilitated by a Watson uh, program called Beat. So Beat basically is trained with uh, all sorts of uh, music genres and uh, the type of genres which is uh, liked by people. So this particular piece was actually composed by that specific um, uh, program, uh, Beat. And then um, it's almost like, you know, uh, it's not just the audience who are listening to music, the music is listening to the audience. So here, this music, uh, Not Easy, is, uh, has actually listened to the audience what they like, and that's what it has produced. Oral B uh, Genius Toothbrush, that's a popular one. I also have it. So they have, a, they have a various senses um, on the top of the brush and elsewhere. And then there is a, there is a small chip there where there's a train, a train model. And then the model gets trained every time um, we brush so that it can actually adjust the brushing speed, the, the circular motion, if there are any vibration and so on. And uh, on an app, it can actually give you feedback as well. Simrise is, an, is a very interesting one. Um, so um, again, this is um, based on uh, Watson. And um, one of the companies from, um, from uh, Germany, they created a train model which can create perfumes. So what it has is it, it has been uh, fed and trained with uh, all the possible known formulas. They bought some patents as well for the formulas for uh, perfumes. And also what are the likings, which perfumes are getting sold where, uh, which is doing good, which is not doing good and so on. Okay, lots of uh, historical data has been used to train the model. Now it can actually generate a formula which is uh, and with a confidence score that this formula, the, the, the model has got confidence of X out of Y that it will succeed. And uh, there was an experiment that was done in, I believe 2019, uh, where in Berlin, uh, a perfume was generated um, based on uh, user inputs as well within six weeks. Uh, it was called Berlin 3.0. Robobee is, a, is a, a trained model, which then feeds into artificial bees for uh, pollination for, um, for uh, farmers. Beauty.ai was a controversial one. So there was a beauty contest that happened where there were no judges. So the judgment was uh, done by machine uh, vision and a trained model and they were actually scoring the contestants. It was turned out that um, the model Hello, Pooja ma'am. Yes, sir. Is there some issue? Yes, sir, sir. Maybe from sir. Yeah. You can wait for a moment. Yes, yes. So, uh, Pooja ma'am, in the meantime, uh, Shri Satish Rayar sir has also joined. Yes, yes. Good morning, sir. 
good morning good morning sir gautam sir must be uh, joining again uh, he he must be joining. yes good morning sir good morning good morning raj sir kaise hain sir theek hai it is always a pleasure meeting you and listening you same here sir <laughs> Pujam, he joining back. Yes, yes. So he has joined. Yes, sir. He has joined. Please see. No, 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 sir. No, sir, not. Ah, uh, no, he is not joining. I got his message that he is joining. Uh, he has joined. Mr. Gautam has joined. Kepi Singh ji, please. Uh -huh. okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, Can sir. you hear me? Uh -huh. yes, I'm yes, really sir. sorry. I no, don't no. know what happened. It just no. got disconnected and then, you know, I was not able to join. I'm really sorry. No, 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 no. no. It's uh, no, 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 sir, Dada, please. Uh, Dada, just, uh, uh, just to mention, Mr. Satish Rai, uh, he has also joined. Hi, Satish. Hello, sir. Hi, good to good to hear your voice after you know, <laughs> I don't know how many decades. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two decades at least. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, I I just got uh, disconnected. I'll I'll continue there and I'll speed up a bit. Um, as I was saying, uh, beauty dot AI that was a bit controversial because it was seen, and that's one of the problem with. Uh, with um, with data science, machine learning, and AI as well as the as the previous speaker was uh, saying as well that uh, if there is a bias in the training process, then it becomes a bit of a challenge. Actually. 
city and that's what was found here so the process uh, okay uh, people with fair skin when there was a you know the, the skin color was different um, so uh, the next one is uh, emotional temperature so that is something that's uh, uh, that's heavily used by neurologists right now and also some of the uh, social media like facebook facebook uses emotional temperature behind the scene just by looking into uh, you know the posts or the selfies that's been uploaded and behind the scene they're uh, doing some you know interesting work and some work for the society uh, they don't publicize it that much uh, I'm aware that they actually use the emotional model to uh, really go through um, those model at the, the authorities. So just to show that, you know, ML is not just disrupting the usual businesses, but getting into the businesses where we thought that there is still some time, like the creative ones. Uh, one of the things that is extremely important to realize is uh, this is about data science, right? The word data is extremely important. The previous speaker was talking about that as well. So it becomes, uh, I mean, all the, let's say, algorithms and the maths behind, uh, you know, they have been there since uh, some of them, the basic one, as we all know, the bias theorem. Uh, that's the basis of uh, majority of the algorithms. That's been there since the early 18th century, right? So that's not the important bit here. So the mathematics, the, the linear algebra space, the calculus space, uh, we're not doing much invention there. Um, the most important bit is the data. And then just to show some you know, anecdotes to that is, uh, even if Bayes theorem is there since 1763, we only have seen um, the businesses start to use it or all the innovations that we see from 2012. So why was it that, uh, you know, all the, let's say mathematical basis were there, even, you know, uh, one of the first machine, which was created even with the diode and triad valves, uh, which was a neural network machine, was uh, it was called SNARK. It was created in 1951, but still we had to wait till 2012 uh, to, you know, get the get the ball rolling within the industry. What actually happened in 2012? So in 2012, what happened was in 2012, the ImageNet project uh, got AlexNet. Which uh, very with with very very high accuracy, it started to classify. This is an image of a dog. This is an image of uh, a cat, and so on. And then, if you see why that thing happened, it's all uh, about data. Interestingly, it is one of the you know um, most uh, kind of talked about uh, story about convergence, because it all started. Uh, it never started in even in the field of uh, mathematics. It started in the field of medicine by these two gentlemen, one from Canada, Dr. Hubel, and one from uh, Sweden, Dr. Wiesel. They were two neurophysiologists. They uh, figured out how the neurons fire in cat when some visual stimulus is created. And then they published a paper in around 1959, and they got a, little, was a computer scientist from Tokyo. He picked that up, thought it's an interesting idea. Maybe I can use the same concept of firing of neurons to create an artificial um, neural network. And that was the first artificial neural network, or rather a convolutional neural network that was uh, created. That was 1980. But still, Nothing happened in the business uh, field. So one of the researchers from Princeton, Fei-Fei, not about complex algorithms, it's something else. The human eye um, has got, a, I mean, average human eye has got a capacity of 10 frames per second. So we can actually, you know, get 10 images per second registered uh, in our brain. So if you calculate the amount of data that is fed to a child, for example, so every hour it will be 36,000 images. So think that as, uh, you know, label training data. 
that uh, that a child gets when uh, he or she is going through that stage. So within a year, it's around uh, 300 million uh, images. So that many training, uh, label training data that our human brain is processing. So it's all about data. We cannot compare with uh, the amount of data that we were feeding the algorithm. We were more focusing on the algorithms. Pooja, ma'am. Hello. Yes, sir. I think. Uh, sir, sir is already there. Now, now, now he is there. Sir, huh. sir is there. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, yes. I can. Okay, I don't know what's going on. It's uh, throwing me out of the network. Anyway, so <laughs> that's what. Um, so just to show that what was missing from the world was the data, and that's why the data science word is uh, very very appropriate. When we started to value the value the uh, what data can bring in within the machine learning world, then you know. Uh, every other area started to uh, flourish. And then now, as we saw earlier, that almost every business, whether it is creative or repetitive, that's getting disrupted. I'll talk about a few things where I am uh, personally involved in uh, as a practitioner uh, for machine learnings. Telecoms is what I have been working on for the last uh, 20 years. So within telecoms, especially, um, after 5G has become at the forefront, um, machine learning is used uh, extremely drastically in areas where we never thought we will use. Uh, you may know that uh, iPhone even has got a, um, a dedicated chip similar to the GPU, which does the machine learning processing. So um, within 5G, um, the network is, is virtual. What does that mean is the same network is not used by all sorts of use cases at the same time. The network can be sliced. Uh, what does that mean is within the same network uh, pipe or bandwidth, a slice can be used for, for example, high throughput IoT. Another pipe can be used for human voice interaction, like the phone interactions. Another pipe can be used for, let's say, low latency um, networks, like, for example, for um, automated cars or remote surgery and so on. And then that slicing is very dynamic. So um, depending on the demand, that's one slice can be reduced or increased. But to uh, do that, there's a lot of you know, handshake that needs to happen. So now trained machine learning models are uh, preempting that. So they are deciding, OK, maybe we need to uh, rejug all the slicing uh, based on what we have learned so far. So it's done. It's not decided by, or, you, or it doesn't wait until there is a demand coming. So the machine learning model detects that there is a demand coming um, in some time. So let's start all the handshakes so that there is um, the efficiency is, uh, is, is reset. Um, so beam management is, uh, is very, very tricky um, within mobile networks, especially you know, when the mobility is happening within uh, urban areas where there are high rise towers and so on, because the beams get uh, uh, deflected, reflected, refracted, attenuated. So from the antenna or the base stations, when the beams are, um, or from the, from the mobile devices, when the beams are going back and forth, if there are obstructions there, then they get uh, um, distracted, basically. Um, and within 5G base stations, which are very, very small base stations, the beams are very, very targeted. So they are not just broadcasting everywhere. It, it uh, beams towards the mobile device. And when the mobile device moves, the beams need to move as well. Uh, towards the mobile devices. So that is actually now done through a trained machine learning model because it needs to kind of predict where the mobile device will be moving, whether it will be moving left or right, because you know turning out the beam 
there are again some handshakes that needs to happen and it's an expensive process so if some idea can be um, created beforehand the, uh, then you know it can be done more efficiently the device experience uh, enhancement that's happening i uh, mentioned the iphone uh, thing so you know right now in majority of the mobile devices the smartphones especially uh, when we take uh, an image uh, the entire image processing happens through uh, trained machine learning models, which sits within the device because our devices are so uh, powerful now. So when we were studying, probably uh, those machines are, you know, not even closer to the mobile devices that we carry around in our pockets right now. And uh, device security is extremely important now, especially after uh, uh, almost everything is happening through um, through our mobile devices whether it is uh, banking transactions or opening up our uh, front door or opening the garage door or looking after our elderly to assisted living. So uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, crowdsource are doing endpoint uh, monitoring using uh, machine learning. Now uh, the telecoms are using machine learning model to check for device security. When a device is making a connection to a network, there's a lot of check that happens uh, which, which are fed into train models, which then can identify whether there is a threat on that device or not, whether some due diligence that needs to happen or not, whether the user needs to be uh, alerted or not. And um, as I was mentioning during beam management that, uh, you know, the beams move and it needs to predict whether the mobile device is moving left, right, or whether it is stationary or not. And then at some point, uh, there needs to be a decision on handing over because the um, uh, maybe one of the base stations or the antenna cannot cover now uh, the mobile device because it is going out of range. So then it needs to decide that I now need to do a handover to the next uh, base station. So those things are an extension of the beam management process that I was referring to earlier. And that is also now done by machine learning models rather than you know doing it through some rules which are not that efficient. Another maybe most interesting thing that I find out right now is um, NLP. Uh, natural language processing, because we don't realize it, but language is very, very hard. When you start to practice NLP, you will realize how hard it is. I just picked some examples uh, here. So there's a word uh, run, right? It can be used as a noun, as a verb. We don't realize it. When we, when we say that, you know, I run every morning or we will run out of milk soon, it's the same word, but you see the way it is used is completely different. For humans, it's very easy to pick the context. When I'm saying I run every morning or I have an idea, I'll, I like to uh, run past you. We can pick out the context, but for machines, it's extremely difficult. Um, and then also in uh, what reference it is, um, it is used. So for example, this is a classic uh, sentence used by NLP practitioners. Uh, the animal didn't cross the street because it was tired. Who is it? Is it the street or is it the animal, right? For us, it's very easy. How, how can the street be tired? It has to be the animal. We know it, right? We humans know it. But for machines, it's extremely difficult. For it, it's a 50-50 chance of an animal being tired or a street being tired. But how will it decide? So then, you know, it becomes, uh, it becomes a big challenge. But on the other hand, NLP has got huge potential. Uh, in the overall business. So, you know, uh, language is the best user interface. So far, all the user interfaces we have been using are not really, you know, uh, human. So we use keyboards, we use screens, uh, but language is the best interface. And that's why these voice-based things are, you know, uh, so much popular. But the reality is, um, we have, we have not been there yet. This is why in the Gartner hype cycle earlier, you saw that NLP is still placed just below the, the hype uh, peak. We are getting there. So um, last year, uh, Microsoft and Alan Turing Institute published uh, uh, NLP trained uh, GPT-3 model, which has been trained using 175 billion parameters. That's probably one of the, one of the you know, biggest uh, NLP models uh, so far, and still so much of research is going on uh, on uh, NLP uh, right now. 
and um, I'll, I'll skip this. These are the different things that are needed in NLP. I mean, we don't realize when we, you know, talk in a natural language, but uh, the machine needs to be trained. Machine doesn't understand grammar. It needs to be, uh, I mean, because it doesn't understand really language. It needs to understand uh, the tokens and the vectors. Some of the areas where uh, NLP is transforming the businesses is credit assessments. Because if you see how credit assessments work, is uh, it is either based on discussions with the, the credit agent or uh, providing some documents. So processing those documents is very, very expensive. It takes time. Uh, it needs very skilled persons. And also then it's not accurate. But if you have trained uh, NLP models, uh, the credit assessment becomes much more accurate, less risky, and less expensive. Um, um, uh, uh, so customer interaction, we have already seen, right? Chatbots, like there are loads of companies using chatbots right now, where the customer interaction is uh, much more automated. Healthcare is another industry where it is transforming. I talked about Babylon, which is, uh, you know, with, where there is there are no doctors. The, the triaging is done by uh, a machine learning model. And on top of that, there is, a, uh, there is an NLP interface where humans can interact like it is interacting with, uh, with a doctor. Another thing where uh, I mentioned about um, the logics who are transforming the... Um, uh, the contract management area uh, by using a trained model. One of the things where I am personally involved with, and it's, it's, um, it's something that I'm working with some of the universities here, so Warwick University and Sheffield University, and also with the UK government uh, innovation uh, departments and cybersecurity departments, where we are trying to uh, basically figure out, because you know from Telco's perspective, I was involved heavily in the 5G standardization, so when you create a standard, um, there are other, let's say, innovators who are creating patents as well. And then they always clash, right? The standards need to be open. So if you create a 5G standard for, let's say, beam management, and an innovator is actually patenting how beam management works. And if the, these two clash, then what do you do, right? So then there is a concept of um, standards, essential patents where you are already aware that if you need to implement that standard, even if it is open, still there is a patent there. So you need to be aware of that. So what happens is uh, right now, there are very, very expensive patent lawyers. They need to actually figure that out because standards are very, very complex. So some of the radio standards for 5G, they're around you know, 2,000, 3,000 pages long. And then the patents are written in very, very complex language anyway, which only the lawyers can understand. So how do we actually marry these two? So I was working, I'm still working on, a, on, on creating a model and create some uh, new mathematics around that so that we can actually figure out by reading uh, a, a patent uh, through an NLP interface and then going through all the standards that there is a match, which means that implementing that standard could actually violate some patents. Uh, and, uh, you know, because the lawsuits here are in sometimes in uh, billions, you may have seen one last week uh, from Apple, which was, uh, I think, 1.5 billion US dollars. Uh, the last one I want to talk about is uh, medical diagnostics. Uh, this is very, very close um, to my heart. This is not, I'm, this is something that I'm not doing uh, for my work, but this is something I started as an open source initiative, um, you know, because uh, we all have um, gone through this. So, for example, for cancer diagnostic, we have we have seen that. Uh, I'm sure you may have your personal experience as well, where you have seen near and dear have gone through, um, you know, some deadly diseases where uh, machine learning or trained models can help with the diagnostic at an early stage and early stage uh, detection can save lives. So for some of the cancers, uh, early stage diagnostic can actually save 75% of the life. So I, I listed some of, the, some of the models which are doing you know, great. These are all research works, but they're doing great uh, in the diagnostic and mostly uh, in the cancer area. 
So this is something um, that I started as an open source initiative. So Dr. Pandey is uh, involved as well. He is helping out wherever possible, where we're trying to create a, a trained model for uh, detecting ovarian cancer at the earliest stage possible with the most or the least uh, expensive means uh, through 2D ultrasound uh, images. So that at that stage only, we can actually detect or with um, you know, sufficient accuracy, whether the tumor seen in a 2D ultrasound image is uh, cancerous or not, whether it is benign uh, or not. And uh, with that, I would uh, conclude and uh, I would quote one of my favorite uh, author, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, that um, it's, it's called uh, Clarke's Third Law uh, as a joke. So any sufficiently advanced technology is uh, indistinguishable from magic. And what we are seeing now in the data science field and in machine learning almost feels like magic. Um, you know, uh, identifying or detecting uh, cancer at an early stage is magic because it will save life. Um, detecting a cyber threat is magic. Uh, creating a song out of nowhere is magic. Writing a poetry out of nowhere, writing the next chapter of Harry Potter by a trained model is magic. But we need to be very, very careful here as well that you know that magic can go either way. So that's why ethical AI is um, the term that we should all uh, remember. So thank you very much uh, for my time. And again, sorry about all the you know technological disruptions that happened earlier. Uh, thank you so much.